hi so my uh basically my um problem or my like complex problem is the homeless crisis and I am focusing on rehabilitating homelessness. Um, the PowerPoint is available. I will include it in a, another link. Um, so basically, I don't know if you can see the pictures, but there are two homeless people right here. One of them is literally passed out on the street. The other one clearly has vomited and is laying in their own vomit. And this is so sad. And these photos should make you sad. This is so horrible. It should grieve you. The homeless crisis is not a um, thing to take lightly. So there's multiple questions regarding homelessness. The first one is, do we just give them a home? Does lowering the cost of housing and giving the homeless a home solve the problem? Okay, so according to the National Alliance to End Homelessness, several major cities with high home, um, housing costs Topping the list um, with the highest likelihood of homelessness include uh, San Francisco, New York City, Los Angeles, Boston, Washington, D.C., Portland, Seattle. Um, and implementing solutions to housing affordability um, crisis in those areas would tremendously advance the goal of ending homelessness. Although this is a factor um, inexpensive housing or even temporary free housing is not going to solve uh, the uh, isn't going to solve uh, the issue. <laughs> um, many homeless people who um, make it into homes often find themselves back on the streets and repeating the cycle. Mental illness and substance abuse along with eviction due to substance or substandard living and often um, even trashing the homes that they are freely provided is a tragic pattern that plays out for many. Also, the Seattle Times interviewed seven former homeless people who did exactly that, what I just shared, trashing it and ending up back on the streets. They discovered that many never fully heal from the survival mode that scarred them when they were living homeless. And they also didn't have the support of the social workers, the mental health providers to help them to continue to heal and to stay clean once they were placed in those housing. And this is, um, uh, sorry, this um, created room for some of the homeless to find themselves back in the streets again. Others mentioned that they couldn't even begin to think of healing until they had a place to go we cannot focus on committing to case management, securing employment, or making the decisions to address substance use disorders, um, disorder issues, while wondering if we have a place to sleep for the night, a place to store our belongings, a place to collect our mail, shower in safety, a place free of harassment or drug sales, and exploitation until there are more housing first options available with co-occurring services other services become stressors to manage instead of solutions to um, attach to okay so another one is are drugs and mental illness associated across the board mental illness is a defining marker for homeless people and many battling with schizophrenia, bipolar, so sociopathy, severe depression, and self-mutilation. Many are self-medicating with a cocktail of drugs and alcohol that can create partial or even total separation from reality on both a temporary and semi-permanent basis. A brain that is constantly chemically altered leads to levels of mental and physical impairment from a medical standpoint. Also, according to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, we hypothesize that personal autonomy is generally reduced by mental illness. Autonomy can be affected in five prototypical mental disorders, major depressive disorder, substance abuse or substance abuse disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, anorexia nervosa, and schizophrenia. With this, we can see that homeless people who are battling mental disorders need to be cared for. And because they are unfit to care for themselves, they also are a danger to others because 
of their mental impairment, okay? Uh, homelessness per capita is on the rise since 2017, according to the National Alliance for Ending Homelessness. Homelessness has been on the rise since 2017, experiencing an overall increase in 6%. And in 2022, counts of individuals, 421,392 people, and those that were chronically homeless were 127,768, which reached a record high in the history of data collection. And 22% are chronically homeless individuals or people with disabilities, mental illnesses who have experienced long-term um, and repeat incidences of homelessness. 6% are veterans distinguished by their service to the military, and 5% are unaccompanied youth under the age of 25. There's also very definable patterns for those who are diagnostically mentally ill, making up the largest group among the homeless. And there is a, pop, a population of military veterans and also younger than 25 year olds, as I mentioned. So uh, make homeless, should we make it illegal, okay? Um, 48 out of 50 states currently enforce some level of legislature that says homelessness is illegal. Some people highly disagree with this approach as there's really no other plan aside from uh, the corrected correctional measures and criminalization. The movement of um, invisible people has to say this, if you are homeless, you can be cited and arrested for engaging in any of the following actions in public. Loafing, loitering, resting, standing, sleeping, sitting, and lying down. There are many reasons that these laws are problematic. There, um, the most glaring of this is the fact that it is impossible for a human being to survive without sitting, standing, sleeping, resting, lying down. Criminalizing homelessness costs taxpayers millions of dollars. It is it is a cruel and ineffective way to um, overcrowd prisons and it isn't solving the homeless crisis at hand. Counter responsive to this stance, many believe that homeless, um, or that some form of correctional measure is only, is the only way for homeless to offer or to get off the streets um, inten is, and to be intentionally immersed into society. One former homeless man actually endorsed punitive measures, sharing his powerful testimony and emphasizing the benefits of incarceration and structured removal from the streets. Um, this former homeless man specifically shared, my suffering became unbearable. I began to crave a lengthy stay in jail because um, even amid the fog of addiction, I realized I needed to be forcibly detoxed and separated from drugs and jail was the only available answer. So that level of like hopelessness is so pervasive in like homeless community that they're literally saying like, actually it would be good for us to get off the streets. Okay, drug abuse and mental illness, are they associated? Um, so across the board, Mental illness is a defining marker of homelessness and people battling with, I think I did go through this already. I'm so sorry if I did. I'm pretty sure I just did. I think it just like repeated. That's terrible. Okay, so let's talk about reinstating mental health asylums. In the past, homelessness was not a large problem in our nation, but mental illness was an issue. Insane asylums were created for caring for and keeping those who were mentally unable to care for themselves. And according to jacobin.com, asylums were not equipped to handle the overcrowding leading to um, mistreatment and genuinely horrible conditions for the people who were forced to live in them. Understaffed hospitals, uh, rel um, um, the, those hospitals relied on patient labor in order to do its functions in an, an Oregon State Hospital in 1942, a patient working in the kitchen confused powdered milk with cockroach poison and served it to um, patients killing 47 people and poisoning hundreds more. And due to that horrific failure of those overcrowded facilities, the government voted to close them down and release mentally ill people in society um, to fend for themselves 
and to navigate the world via the use of antipsychotic drugs. And we can clearly see that that decision just like works so well, my word, like so, so, so successful, right? According to the historical article, a federal joint commission on mental illness and health recommended in 1962 that all state hospitals be limited in size and gradually converted into care centers for any and all chronic health conditions. The focus would then be on the cont continuity and actually eradicating mental illness before it took over. Um, signed off by JFK just before his assassination, the bill promised to treat people where they lived and return them to a useful place in society. The tragic thing is that the government and medical professionals have dropped the ball massively. And many people are only treated if they can afford it. Additionally, no one is being returned to a useful place in society as they promised. And they promised that they would when they shut down the mental health facilities. And there are a lot more broken people running around and being improperly cared for today. There's also currently a lot of discussion for re-implementing mental health facilities, also known as insane asylums, to aid in the homeless crisis. And there's also many states that have made homelessness illegal to some degree. And many people consider placing homelessness or homeless with mental illnesses in an asylum to care for them. Even former President Trump called for a return for the mental institutions as part of his plan to get homeless off our streets should he be re-elected for a second term. The state-run psychiatric hospitals that largely disappeared in the mid-1900s are often associated with inhumane mistreatment, which is what I had mentioned before. But a large percentage of people living in the streets are not capable of living independent because they suffer from severe mental and illness and health problems. While the opposition deems it inhumane, forward thinker um, and writer said that liberals are starting to join conservatives and calling for the return to an era of mass involuntary hospitalization for mentally ill homeless people. But that is um, this person and this person's opinion, a failure of imagination. And instead we need public provisions of healthcare, housing, and employment. Okay, so let's see what has worked so far. According to the Home More Project, Finland's approach to housing first for individuals who experience it. In 2007, a plan was introduced to provide permanent housing, making and solving um, health and social problems, such as uh, making them much less complicated. People um, who were homeless are given permanent housing on a typical lease that can range from self-contained uh, apartment to even housing on a block with continuous support and tenants pay rent and are qualified to receive housing benefits. And then depending on their income, they can contribute to the cost of their support services that they receive and local government covers the rest. In Japan, supporter, um, support communities um, um, they ex that have experienced homelessness, they offer temporary housing provisions and employment advice to lower the amount of those that experience homelessness over the years. And Denmark experienced uh, a, percent, a percentage of uh, individuals who experience homelessness as less than 0.1% because they implemented the same housing first policy as Finland. There's also the power of testimony. Those who have lived through homelessness have the most empowering and compassionate um, testimony and they're the best advocates. Um, they've recovered from homelessness um, and people are able, they've been able to um, be employed as caseworkers and even coaches and share how they were able to be rehabilitated back into society. And they've been an incredible influence and a success in helping others succeed in getting off the streets and leaving homelessness behind. Okay, then we can also talk about the inspiration of homelessness. So basically art is being used a lot to inspire people. And there's all kinds of opportunities from Cardboard Citizens, which is like an act like a performance um, in uh, London 
to um, choirs in Montreal. Uh, there's a, a um, there's like a 500 member um, dance company in Tokyo. And then there's also um, this jam theater, which does a lot of like Shakespearean stuff in Johannesburg. And then um, there's also this amazing guy named Tom KD, who's out of, he's Irish, and he also raps about how that drug abuse and all of that has put him on the streets. It's so incredible. It's so inspiring. Giving homeless people an a, a ability to tap into their soul and their heart again and just connect with that is giving them so much opportunity. So I'm going to talk about my five-step proposition for homeless recovery. Okay? <clears throat> Step one is to reinstate mental health asylums with much more rigid sanctions concerning the care and the requirements for patients, employing modern technology, documentation, and policies for penalization and practices if they're not carried out well. These facilities will also provide trauma therapy and trained cl clinicians. So we're going to like associate that to like a retirement home or like a home that you would put like people that are physically and mentally disabled. Um, we actually already have structures like this in place for those individuals. And we would never leave like underage minors or uh, elderly people that can't really take care of themselves anymore because their brain has like literally not functioned the right way. We would never, or people with disabilities, leave them like that. So we should not do this to these homeless people. We should actually implement this right away. Secondly, access to resources, um, to all the resources and requiring each city um, and on a state level to provide homes that will be used as houses of reacclimation for homeless in their society. This should be accomplished with both national and state funding. We have so much resources from all kinds of different directions that if we funnel it and pull it correctly, we could really easily do this. Third, make homelessness 100% illegal nationwide so that sleeping and living unhomed is no longer an option. And this is not so that we penalize or incriminate them, but this is so that we can solidly enforce a way to help them, not what's already existing. That is bunk. We do not want people going to prison for this. We want them to basically say, you don't have another option, these are your options. And so I'm gonna explain these options now. So step four, bring all the homeless into custody and triage them. So the first step, those who are examined and considered mentally unfit will be placed in the care of a newly envisioned mental health asylum. Something that's actually gonna be really nice for them and kind to them. Second, those who are chemically dependent and medically ill will be treated and placed in rehabilitation clinics until they are deemed fit to move to the next phase. So we wanna get them clean. Three, newly clean, former homeless persons will be required to se select a different city and state to live in and a preferred occupation. We relocate them so that they don't have the access to all the drug dealers that they're familiar with. We want to get them out of that pattern and, it, and give them to dream again and think about like a job that they would love to do. Then they will be transferred to that preferred occupation and in that new city or state, and they will be placed in a resident, uh, with in a home with a resident director and three to four other recovering homeless individuals or RHIs. So from now on, when I say RHI, it stands for recovering homeless individual. And then they will be placed in an apprenticeship connected to their preferred occupation. So we're going to train them and get them planted in a, in a job that actually gives them something to look forward to and helps them to get something structured and in place. Each RHI, Recovering Homeless Individual, will be provided with a social caseworker, a trauma-informed, clinically trained mental health counselor, and a recovering success coach. These three professionals, along with the resident director, will work in tandem and along with the apprenticeship management to ensure long-term success of each RHI, okay? Step five. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to explain this a little more on the next slide, but over the next 1.5 to 2.5 years, the RHI will meet certain acclimation markers 
and matriculate to the next level of recovery. And the goal is that in less than three years, the RHI will be able to thrive stably and independently. We want to see these people live their purpose out, okay? So support teams for the RHI. So we're gonna talk about the role of the resident director. They will direct the home life of the RHI. They will be responsible for the transportation to and from the apprenticeship workplaces. They will administer, administer bi-weekly drug tests as needed. They, um, for the first year, they will manage the bills, the consumables, the groceries, and the needs for the home. And they will be co um, covered through the nation and the state and the nonprofit funding along with a portion of the RHI's apprenticeship paycheck. So resident directors will also apply positive street level peer pressure within the homes. The goal is basically for each RHI to matriculate out of the program. So positive peer pressure looks like one um, person, if one person messes up and relapses or is really not trying, it sets the other RHIs in the home back. All of them just kind of get backed up a bit. And this helps them to learn teamwork and how to be strong for each other. And this also helps them to see that they are st as strong as their weakest member. And they can also encourage a culture of honesty and celebration of accountability towards success. So we want to implement that positive peer pressure in the home. Okay, now for the role of the social caseworker. They will manage the paperwork regarding the RHI and document improvement or issues. They are responsible for the apprenticeship placement and tracking the progress on the job. They're also monitoring and confirming the time for matriculation in accordance with all the details provided by the resident director, the mental health counselor, the recovery success coach, and management workplace apprenticeship. Okay, now role for the mental health counselor. They will strategically use their professional capacity to help RHIs navigate trauma and patterns of pain through uh, the perpetuated patterns of homelessness in the past. And they will meet with the RHI on a weekly basis and help them heal and process through the internalized pain. That is so critical. That is why we are having so much problems as well. People need healing really bad. Okay, also role of recovery of the success coach. So they will get um, set up with strategic personalized plans with each RHI and communicate the goals um, to be met for the matriculation to the next level of recovery. These will be the RHI's biggest cheerleaders and they will be integral in teaching skills like budget management, resume building, how to put your best foot forward, confidence, communication, excellence, how to successfully reach goals like acquisition of a motorized vehicle. Um, they will even train on how house maintenance, upkeep, safety requirements. They will be able to provide RHIs with homework assessment uh, assignments and reflection activities that will help them to grow and discover what they understand and be able to ask questions for the things that they don't know. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the matriculation process for RHIs. I'm sorry, this is so much, but like I put so much work into this. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. So for year one, the first month, obviously detox and then relocate in a placement of a home and an apprenticeship. Month two, RHIs need to be able to maintain a steady employment at the apprentice. Okay, so month two through seven, sorry. They need to be able to maintain employment at an apprenticeship for at least six months before a job will solidly be offered to them. They should be paid partial wages, at least half of the minimum wage while being trained. And that money will be going towards their bills and things too, okay? So then once they have worked at an apprenticeship for six months, as long as they are in good standing with the company, they should be brought onto a regular full-time position or some level of employment towards full-time status. Movement to employment is matriculation number one, okay? Um, then from month eight to 12, RHIs continue to live in the home with the resident director and the three to four other RHIs. As long as there is no setbacks personally or inside the home, RHIs will step into matriculation number two. 
by the 12 month mark. If there is any setbacks or delays, it will just put it back a couple of months and then they will eventually matriculate to the next level, okay? On the second year, matriculation, this is for a whole year. Matriculation number two is where RHIs will be moved into a house without a resident director, okay? They will live in community with other people that are on that same level as them in that graduated matriculation number two area. They will be accountable to um, a property manager who will still hold them accountable for monthly drug and alcohol testing and the RHIs will be aided minimally with rent and financial aid for food and consumables. Their recovery success coach will help them manage finances during this process and their employment will be part of paying for the home. During the time, RHIs will still meet regularly with their um, counselors and success coaches for as long as needed and RHIs can stay in this up to two years. But the goal is to get them to matriculation number three. So ideally one, one year and 1 1.5 years in this, but they can do it for two, okay? Just to get their bearings, okay? But year three is when they would matriculate, matriculation number three, ideally. This is where caseworkers aid them, uh, successful RHIs into locating affordable housing within their budget according to their earned wages, and then they can opt to either live with others or on their own. RHIs effectively matriculate out of the RHI program and can live fully on their own. Again, as graduates of the program, they always have access to resources like counseling, advice from success coaches, future job placement if necessary, but for all intents and purposes, they are no longer system dependent. That is so important, guys. Like, that is so critical. So honestly, this just makes me happy thinking about it because they can succeed. But what if they fail, okay? Good news is that <clears throat> the RHIs will be encouraged and supported the entire way. We don't want them to experience um, uh, punishment or to be heavy on them so that they want to give up. What we want is for them to succeed. And if they have setbacks, to... Um, in substance abuse or being terminated from a job or uh, apprenticeship or any other reason, even if they like end up breaking the law somehow, we ultimately want them to succeed long-term. Our goal would be um, to go back to the drawing board and provide more structure and monitoring so that they can keep moving forward to recovery. They are not the problem. This is so critical. They're not the problem, they're the mission, and the goal is their success and recovery, okay? So what if they don't want to do the program and attempt to go back to living in the streets? Ultimately, homeless, homelessness and living in the streets as a substance abuser will be illegal, and they can choose one of three options. Number one, they can go to the homeless recovery or rehabilitation program. They can go to prison, that's the second one. It is not ideal and honestly, it's heartbreaking, but that's an option. Or three, we could require every state, every single state to designate a parcel of land somewhere away from the major cities and civilization and erect crude dwelling places that are temperate, provide um, areas with running water and latrines and require as minimal maintenance as possible. There would be elect. There would be no electricity, but there would be brick fireplaces um, that would be uh, available with minimal maintenance. Um, and then military grade food and canned goods would be delivered to the area bi-weekly. And um, an assessment of those who need medical treatment would be provided, but that would be, uh, they would not be allowed to panhandle. They would not be allowed to live in the cities. They would be required to stay in that designated area unless they're going to a doctor or to court for some reason or if they're opting to join the homeless rehabilitation program. Um, so anyway, I don't like that, but that that's an option. Okay, now this is the last part. This is an all hands on deck effort. This requires everybody. Um, so many incredible nonprofit ministries currently exist to help homeless every single day from the United Way to Salvation Army, to the local homeless shelters, to um, food banks, every bit helps. and. It all is needed. The, um, these efforts do not go away or be replaced with new um, 
with the new homeless recovery initiative. They just need to pivot a little and strategize in the best way that they can use their resources and systems to aid in setting the homeless people up for success. As the body of Christ, we have a major role and responsibility here. Believers know that it is our duty and privilege to help solve the problem and direct, and it's directly linked to the Great Commission. They know that it is God's desire for those who are homeless to not only be restored to homes, but be saved, set free, healed, delivered, walking out the purpose that God has for them. Okay, um, so Matthew 10, 7 through 8 says, Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure the leprosy, cast out demons, give freely as you have received. It is the way that we effectively love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbor as ourself. We don't want to be like the rich young ruler who failed in this area. Mark 10, 21 through 23 says, looking at him, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing that you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and then come and follow me. And at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions and Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We do not want to value our possessions and ourselves over obedience to God and his commission and his command to love others and to take care of the poor. That is not our desire. In multiple places, in both the Old and the New Testament, it is clear direction from the Lord to care for the poor, the downcast, the broken. Jesus himself made a regular point to minister to the beggars who were disabled in various ways and to also set many free who are bound by evil and unclean spirits. A few passages, uh, Proverbs nineteen seventeen says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. And then Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19 says, for the Lord your God is a God of gods and a Lord of lords, a great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widows and shows um, love to the foreigner residing among you and gives food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. And in this passage, you can make a parallel with widows and orphans and foreigners to those that are the most vulnerable in our society, the downcast, the poor, and those having a hard time, our homeless people. So anyway, I'm just sharing all this with you. The, this is what I felt from the Lord to share. I really, really believe, I'm so sorry that it was such a long assignment. <laughs> sorry for that. It was a long assignment, but I put so much work into it. If you have any advice for me, go for it. I just put like my soul into this. So I really hope that you really take it to heart. Thank you for your time.